for good reason. But the problem, the, 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 there was a famous case, John Wong, who was um, uh, a, a very ardent fundraiser for the Clinton administration. He was actually a under secretary or deputy sec under secretary in the Department of Commerce. And the Republicans accused him of siphoning information in these meetings, which he had deliberately recused himself whenever there's sensitive information that that he was being wrongly accused. What, in the end, no charges. He was out of a job, and he picked up a huge legal defense bill. So he is much poorer today than he was at the beginning. And for what? For what he thought he was participating in the political process, in the American political process, in the finest tradition, which is to raise money for your candidate of your choice. It's also known as bundler. There was another guy, Norman, um, Norman Xu, HSU. Now he's entirely different. He, he was running a Ponzi scheme and he took everybody's money and he gave some of that to the politicians. And the politicians were very impressed because he seemed to be a very high class bundler who was able to raise a lot of money. So for that, he got to appear sitting next to Hillary uh, Clinton when she was running for president. And of course, that made him even more legitimate and more people participate in his investment scheme. You know? Eventually, it crashed and he's now safely in jail. Right. So there, there are different stories. If you want to read any more about these stories, by the way, and this, this is a commercial, go to my blog. I have all these written down in my blog. <laughs> GeorgeGoo.com. <Okay. laughs> so we're going to leave the, the world of case studies now and move into some other advice for you. Uh, but before we do that, are there any more questions about the cases we've tried to summarize? These are meant, obviously, as sample cases. You know, there, there are dozens more we could have you know, chosen. But we want to give you some that are around different parts of the country, different geographies, different industries, uh, different outcomes, uh, to let you see you know, uh, how much damage can happen to people's lives and careers and their families uh, because of collisions with these legal laws. Okay, I'm now going to talk uh, about travel in particular and a particular form of exposure for Chinese Americans. Uh, in two, uh, 2010, the American Civil Liberties Union brought a lawsuit against the Customs and Border Protection Agency. Those are the men and women in blue uniforms at SeaTac that wear the badges and ask you for your passport when you come back, or open your bags and check your luggage to see if you're bringing in um, sausage or, or, or other things from, from China. We want you to understand what this study revealed. It said between October of 08 and June of 2010, the CBP personnel stopped almost 6,500 people at ports of entry in the United States, about half of whom were US citizens, and went through their electronic devices systematically, their laptops, their smartphones, their iPads, right? and in many of these cases, they turned over the results of this to other agencies. This is an official policy that I found uh, issued in 2009, and I want you to understand this is an actual directive aimed at those men and women in blue uniforms. It says they actively want people to search those electronic devices of travelers coming back to the United States. And I've highlighted in red, they can also reveal information about financial commercial crimes, such as those related to copyright trademark and export control violations. So they specifically say in the policy, these are the kinds of devices we want you to look to search. Also underscore this last point. It's too late in the afternoon for me to go into a long discourse about the Supreme Court authority, but there is no Fourth Amendment protection against search and seizure at the border. The CBP personnel have unlimited authority to turn your luggage, 
your briefcase, your computer, your laptop, <coughs> completely inside out for no reason at all. <coughs> they don't have to have any suspicion. They don't have to have any cause. They don't have to have any search warrant. They can just search if they want to search. So the message to all of you who are traveling back and forth to China, if you take the background that we gave you earlier about the predisposition to see three dots of the line, all right, and they see you coming back from a long trip, they see you with a laptop, they see you with a smartphone, there's probably a higher percentage risk that they may ask, where did you go, who did you meet with, and ask to see your laptop and ask you to open your laptop, and they will scan through it. And they'll look for all the files. And if you have taken company information that's technologically controlled, that should have had an export license, for instance, to go out of the United States, and you're coming back from a business trip to China, you can be accused of having exported that controlled information that's on your device to China. But it's very important for you when you're doing your business travel that you have clear instructions and guidance from your export control officers in your companies, whether it's Microsoft or Boeing or anyplace else. If you're not getting guidance, make sure you know what's on your machine. Make sure that you have gone through your briefcase and thrown out all the flash drives that you forgot about that are at the bottom of the bag, or in your purse, or in your briefcase, or in the little pocket. Because anything that's in there that's controlled, that the government finds, if you took it to China, you could be said to have exported it to China. And then you have to prove where did that bag go? Who had access to that bag? Who had access to that computer? You know, and it's a long, long conversation with the people in blue and with the people in the FBI and the people at Immigration and Customs Enforcement. It's a conversation you really don't want to have. And it can be very damaging. And if they then go to your employer and have a conversation with your employer, you now have a cloud over you. Right? And so now can the company trust you? You can imagine what this can do to your standing and your reputation you know, in your workplace, especially if you're being asked to work on very sensitive projects. So it really is very important for you not only to be pure, but to be appear to be pure, if you understand what I'm saying. To avoid looking shady. <laughs> and, and it has to be understood that you're working in an environment where even if you were born and raised in China and you feel a certain degree of kinship and, and, and comfort with China, you do have to understand that for geopolitical reasons, China does have active intelligence services that are trying to get access to information. So they don't necessarily care about you individually. They care about access to that information. So you could be utterly innocent and you could be caught up in something. So you have to understand that just as the US services are very actively looking to connect dots, other forces in China are equally looking hard for access to technology that may be in your head, that may be in your hard drive, that may be in your laptop, that may be in your memory stick. Another situation of um, innocently stepping over the line there's a case by a name, his name was Chai, Chai Mak, C-H-I-M-A-K. And he's in jail because he was sending his own published papers, collection of published papers, he was sending it to a colleague in China that was his friend. And they, uh, the U.S. government accused him of unauthorized uh, forwarding of information, even though those were all his own publications. There's, there's some debate about that. Okay. That's my, that's my side of the story. <laughs> but I, I think what we're, 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 the reason that we're trying to build this and tie it all back about the explanation of those laws and so forth is you know, your best protection in the workplace is to understand what your workplace work rules are, what your obligations are under your non-disclosure agreements, understand what the export control parameters are around the technologies that you're working with so that you're on firm ground. And if there's any doubt in your mind, you should be talking to your company lawyers. You should be talking to your com company compliance managers bef 
before you put yourself at risk, at risk. because you're at higher risk than your average colleague in the workplace uh, because of your, your ethnicity and your background for all of these reasons. You're at risk on the U.S. side, you're at risk on the Chinese side. We're just asking you to be thoughtful and a little more self-protective uh, when you uh, approach these kinds of situations. So, you know, in summary, what we say is, you know, think about these laws and understand where they come from. Understand your NDAs. You know, the company is increasing. They're taking these things very, very seriously. Um, understand when you're sending otherwise what appear to be innocent emails and so forth and you're using, you know, company phones, company computers, company uh, electronics of any kind, you know, to send material overseas. Think hard, you know, about what they could be read to, to contain later on. You know, you're making a very, very permanent record uh, of the, the, those transmissions whenever you use them. And then, you know, understand again, as I tried to stress to you, if you come back into the United States after an overseas trip and you're carrying electronic media of any kind or electronic devices of any kind, all of those things can be searched. And sometimes they find disastrous things have happened. The, the case that I described at, at dinner last night involved Professor Roth, his name was Reese Roth, tenured professor of physics, a plasma physics expert at the University of Tennessee. He was a contractor for a small aerospace startup that could receive SBIR funding from the US Air Force to do plasma actuators for aircraft and missiles. He was told by the University of Tennessee Export Control Officer, this work that you're doing is very sensitive. It's directly controlled by the military kind of rules, the ITAR rules. So we, we know you're going to give a lecture at Fudan in China. So don't take this material with you on your trip. So what does he do? He puts all the material on his laptop and takes it to China. Then he has technical problems with his laptop. So he gives the computer for several hours to a Fudan University electronic technician. And he completely gives up the, the, the computer with the information for the US Air Force on his machine. Okay. So then he comes back through the United States after the trip and he's met at Detroit International Airport by men and women in blue uniforms. And they promptly grab his computer. Um, they're able to do forensic analysis on it. They can show that it was hooked up to the Fudan network. And then he admitted that he gave the computer to the Fudan technician. And they found all of these reports on his, on his hard drive in the machine. Uh, everybody in this company, basic, the company that you work for pled guilty, the other people pled guilty, they paid huge fines. He decided to go to trial. So Professor Roth fought the case. They, they had a very long multi-day trial. Uh, he was convicted on every single charge that they brought against him. And then he filed appeals. Professor Roth is in his 70s. He received a four-year prison sentence. He may never live another day free. You know, so it was a very ugly case. Very, very ugly case. But shows you the damage that can be caused by traveling with electronic media. You know, and so and we really want to emphasize, you know, be thoughtful about what you're carrying. And then, you know, think about my again, my metaphor of the three dots becoming a line. You know, just understand how other people can see things in your conduct that is otherwise innocent. And so you really have to be very thoughtful and think a little bit ahead, what could this look like, you know, before you do it? And just be thoughtful about how these things can be turned. And understand, particularly if there's a, if there's a difficulty, and there's, this is why you want to consult company counsel in advance, or company compliance personnel in advance, okay? Because if there's a, a problem, those people are not necessarily your friends, and the lawyer for the company is certainly not going to be your lawyer. They're going to be trying to protect the company. And in this day and age, especially in aerospace and defense, with government contracts at risk, the last thing a company needs is to look like it's careless about protecting its technological information against potential espionage. So if they get any kind of signal that this has happened, you know, they they will be 
careful about you as an employee generally, but by and large, you're immediately under suspicion, and they don't really know whether to trust you or not. And so any information you share with a company lawyer is not privileged because they're working for the company, not for you. So it's very important that once you're in that zone, you understand you, know, you may need separate legal counsel of people who really understand this area because it can be very, very difficult, very fast. And then you can be one of those case studies you know, in our next edition of this PowerPoint. We don't want that. So I think uh, if there are some last questions, we'll take a couple more minutes. We're happy to, to answer that. We'll stick around a little bit longer afterwards as well. But we certainly want to express our appreciation for all the co-sponsor organizations, for all the time you've taken to be with us here today and talk about these issues. We think they're important issues. We think they need to be understood by the change working community. And we're doing our part to try to spread that education. Uh, and if there are other organizations that you think would benefit from this, George are happy as volunteers to speak again. But thank you to Seattle University and to CIE and SCA. Else. Oh, and don't forget the critique forms, please. Uh, Sharon's collecting them. So, Angie, come on and back up. Do we have any questions um, for speakers? Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to uh, say a couple of words. I'm Conrad Lee. I'm a city council member. Come, come, up, come up here and use the mic. Can I hear me? Okay, thank you. No Again, uh, my name is Conrad Lee. I've been on the city council in Bellevue for 20 odd years, and I was uh, just the former mayor for the last couple of years. I want to take the opportunity to thank Nelson and George for giving you a lot of good information, and uh, particularly what he had, Nelson, giving you as an ammunition that uh, uh, take heed of all the good advice. Because if you're not careful, you know, you can get into the real bind. However, you know, I believe that uh, uh, all the good work that has been done and illustrated by presentation, why it's so important, the time is so important, that we need to pay particular attention to this uh, problem that we have been Asian Americans, Chinese Americans, you know, regarded as a permanent uh, minority in this country. We look different, you know. Some of us still speak with some accent, but we, you know, and there's a lot of uh, things going on between China and the United States, strategically as well as economically. So I think there's a lot of reasons these things are particularly important. So pay attention. So pay attention. I think it's important. However, I just want to add one thing, you know, to correct the problem fundamentally, because we are in a country of democracy, United States of America. We have to look at politics, politics. And unfortunately, we don't look at politics. We're not even interested in politics. Um, it is how we make policies. You know, political, uh, politics makes policies. Policy makes rules, makes games. George mentioned earlier, very important, this is a country of rules of law. And you cannot fight city of hope because they are supported by laws. And all the great lawyers who have been in the room, Seattle University, they make laws, they make rules to hold up the laws and the rules that people want to make. But it is the politicians that make policies, that promulgate these laws and come up with rules making sure that we work within those rules. And I believe that we haven't paid too much attention to that. We, we have no politicians. I'm the only politician here in this room. <laughs> and we don't respect it. We don't even, you know, uh, basically give any uh, recognition. But it's important, it's grassroots. It's how we affect Congress, how we affect executive branch, the president. How we change the mindset of Congress, and not just Congress, but the state legislators, the city council members, the people who make laws for you, for me, every day, the perceptions, that comes from grassroots, comes from your behavior, your support, your respect, your encouragement for 
people to recognize we are not going to be permanent minority. We have we are not becoming 25% of the Asian population. We have the talents. We have the smarts. And some of us even have money. Right? <laughs> so I think that's important. But how do we make those things to turn into factors that can influence the perceptions, influence our neighbors? You know, I don't get into politics because I say, well, I have the law on my side. No. It's the perception. The ultimately is the belief that they can see the benefit we bring to this country, the trust that they have in us that we make decisions that affect everybody. I think that's key, that's important. So I just want to, I know you all know that, but I believe that you need to do it. And you need to make the difference, make the influence in making sure that politics is important, and we have to respect it, and politicians need the support need your encouragement, need your recognition. Don't just write them off and say these are dumb people, stupid, they don't even make a difference, because they do in fact. But they have a tough job, they're very tough job. As you mentioned, they have to work between a lot of fine lines. The laws are laws, you have to change it, you know, whatever you have to do. So, thank you for being here, thank you for you guys.